Before we start our uh, open forum period, Terry, would you come and lead us in a uh, brief prayer, please? You bow with me. Our gracious Father in heaven, we're thankful for, uh, for this gathering here today. We're thankful for this entire lectureship. We're, we pray that much good will result from it. We pray that you'll look down upon each one of us at this time and forgive us of any unforgiven sins and help us, Father, to, to always have a, a humble spirit and attitude and that we'll always uh, repent when we see that we're in error. We pray that we'll learn much uh, for in the next few days as we've already been learning from these speakers. We appreciate each one. appreciate uh, them preparing these lessons and sharing them with us. We pray for each one who has come here, whether a participant or not, uh, for everyone a safe uh, journey uh, back to their homes. Again, we're thankful for Christ. We're grateful for you sending him. We're grateful for him being willing to uh, die on the cross in our stead. And uh, we are thankful, again, for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As always, in an open forum, it seems that there are far more questions uh, selected than we can possibly get to. <clears throat> so we'll just start with uh, a list here that David has handed me, and we will uh, seek to address some of these, give you an opportunity to chime in if you'd like to. Uh, we're not in the rulemaking business and lawmaking business and legislation business. We're simply in the Bible study business here this afternoon. And uh, at times I'll probably be offering my opinion, and I'll try to make that plain that it's my opinion if I do. But uh, we'll do our best to seek and search answers from God's Word. First question here is, uh, would you please explain what A to Z fellowship is, and is it biblical or not? Well, the uh, New Testament doesn't discuss A to Z fellowship, either uh, specifically or implicitly. This is terminology that arose, I suppose, in about 2006 in a considerable uh, amount of uh, email exchange or exchanges on some of the Yahoo groups, one of them in particular. As uh, matters began to be discussed rather fully pertaining to uh, fellowship with uh, Brother Dave Miller, with those associated with him, uh, Apologetics Press, of course, would be principal in that. Uh, GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Um, and those who were supporting like works. And um, as we tried to press the scriptural issue of fellowship based upon uh, 2 John verses 9 through 11, and we uh, will do well to just go ahead and refresh our memories on that. <clears throat> I'm reading for the American Standard Version. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching, King James says, doctrine of Christ, hath not God, he that abideth in the teaching, doctrine, the same hath both the Father and the Son. If anyone cometh unto you and bringeth not this teaching, receive him not into your house, and give him no greeting. For he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil works. Another of the entities that uh, became very uh, directly involved in uh, these matters was uh, OABS, Online Academy of Bible Studies. And um, there were those uh, associated with that uh, school uh, who were defending uh, continuing fellowship with uh, Brother Dave Miller and those associated with him in spite of Brother Miller's uh, uh, refusal to repent of his uh, errors on elder reaffirmation and uh, reappointment and on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so as uh, 
we argued that one could not have fellowship with one who was not in fellowship with Christ without oneself forfeiting his fellowship with God or with Christ. These brethren who were trying to defend uh, appearing on programs uh, in a conciliatory way with uh, Brother Miller and with those who supported Brother Miller came up with the idea of A to Z fellowship. How far do you go in the generations of fellowship? Uh, Brother A is out of fellowship with the Lord. Brother B speaks with him, and then uh, he's out of fellowship with the Lord. Brother C speaks with him. Are you going to go all the way from A to Z and say you can't have fellowship with any of those who have fellowship with who, those who have fellowship with those who have fellowship all the way back to A. Well, what they failed to, that's where the terminology came from, the A to Z fellowship. What they failed to uh, construe was uh, what Brother Charles Pogue referred to briefly, at least, in his lecture a couple of hours ago. Uh, when uh, B, Brother B, has fellowship with Brother A, who is in error, and then Brother C has fellowship with Brother B. Well, Brother B's already moved to Brother A when he has fellowship with the one who's out of fellowship with the Lord. John says that he is a partaker in his evil deeds if he has fellowship, if he greets him, or if he bids him Godspeed, depending upon which uh, version you are reading. And so the A to Z thing was smokescreen, basically, and uh, really had no uh, scriptural basis or application for its argumentation. And uh, it still doesn't. It uh, gets over into the realm of uh, guilt by association, as the term has been applied to it. And uh, I have written on that subject. I've preached on that subject. Uh, I think uh, uh, David ran an article that I wrote on that subject a few years ago now. But uh, <clears throat> there are certain cases in which you do not have guilt by association. You can associate with people without being guilty of their errors uh, by ignorance. You do not know that they are in error. And uh, you're not uh, condoning their error in doing so. Uh, if you find out that they're in error and then you... <laughs> associate with them in a conciliatory way, then that changes the entire picture. But uh, you also can have association with someone who is in error if you expose their error uh, in the course of the association. Our Lord associated with publicans and sinners, but there was no guilt by association involved. So, um, um, that basically is the uh, A to Z uh, contention, and uh, I'm sure that some others would like to chime in on this. I'd be glad for you to do so. If you don't want to, that's all right. We'll move on. That means that I did a good job of covering this. Either that or y'all are just too lazy to say anything. <laughs> Anyone want to comment? Did I leave anything out? Oh, we've got one. Danny, you are. You could have come right around here, brother. He went all the way from A to Z to get here. Tell us who you are and where you're from if you're not ashamed of it. Just call my name. Well, Danny Douglas, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, Central Church of Christ. Uh, regarding A to Z fellowship, excuse, um, some of these brethren seem not to realize that the refusal to fellowship error is part of the doctrine of Christ. As one of the brethren pointed out earlier today, Ephesians 5.11. So when brethren teach error and others disregard that, they themselves are no longer abiding in the doctrine of Christ. So that would mean that the refusal to fellowship them who disregard God's law and fellowship is a first generational thing. It's not A to Z. The fact that they refuse 
to abide on the Lord's teaching regarding fellowship is within itself a departure from the doctrine of Christ. And so that, that should refute that false argument that, uh, you know, they're accusing us of practicing so-called AZ fellowship. Now, can I make a comment about something else? Oh, well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, regarding yesterday's discussion, uh, I think the brethren did a fine job dealing with uh, praying to God the Father and how that that's all we're authorized to do. Uh, and, I, and I know that they would agree, I'm sure they would agree with me about this too, that we can sing songs of praise to the Godhead. For example, the doxology, praise to Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And also, Christ, we do all adore thee, songs like that. <coughs> as long as the song does not teach that we are praying to anyone of the Godhead except the one we are authorized to pray to, that's God the Father, Matthew 6 9. But certainly we can praise deity overall in our singing. And I, I know they would not disagree with what I'm saying here, but. I want everyone to understand that, especially those who might be out there uh, listening on the Internet, that we can sing songs like that. Uh, but there are some that teach, for example, in my night of dark despair, Jesus heard and answered prayer. Well, that's teaching something contrary there, that we are praying to one other than the Father. Certainly... I'm sure this has been pointed out, too, that the Godhead is involved in our prayers. For example, we pray through Jesus, the Son of God, our great high priest, Hebrews 4, 14, 16. But we pray to God the Father. So that's basically Brother Dub. Okay. Appreciate you. Good job. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. David Brown, Spring, Texas. I wanted to mention this. Brother... Lester Camp wrote this some years ago, and uh, you can order them still from you. Um, this is one on guilt by association. You know, that wasn't a problem, I don't believe. Before 2005. Before 2005. I remember, and that article's still there somewhere, the late Bill Jackson wrote on it. And it circulated, and he was very good friends of a great many of these brethren who have now uh, repudiated the idea uh, and said, well, it's, this guilt by association is not not a bad thing. can't be done. But if you'd like a track to keep and hand out, whatever, this is an excellent one. You can get a hold of Brother Lester Camp and he can make them available to you. And regarding what Brother Danny said, I think we have to recognize there is a difference in uh, praying to someone, in this case, Jesus or the Holy Spirit rather than the Father, and an inscription of praise. That's what worship is in showing our devotion to God, is ascribing praise to those who deserve the praise. And when you use the term God, that's not always referring simply to the first person of the Godhead, our Heavenly Father. God, uh, one God, means there's one deity. Well, that one deity is made of a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The praise that one deity is to praise all three persons of the Godhead. So there has to be a distinction made between the teaching of the New Testament and who we're authorized to by that teaching when we pray to God and then ascriptions of praise in the process of worshiping God. The, the main word for, Greek word for worship is proskuneo. There are others, but that's the one that's used most. And it has to do with actually kissing the hand toward or falling prostrate before the one who is to be um, praised. In the book of Revelation, you remember the, uh, John fell before the angel. And the angel told him not to do that. Get up. I'm a servant of God. Worship God. And then you think about the meaning of the word worship and the ascription of praise. Uh, how even the figurative language of the book of Revelation in reference to Jesus 
uh, shows that he is worthy of honor. And that's uh, having to do with one's demonstration of devotion to the one who deserves that devotion. So those, those differences must be made clear, I think, as we delineate between uh, what the New Testament says about who we're to actually address a prayer to, through whom we go to that being, the Father, and such things as that. Thank you. Thank you, David, and I'm glad you reminded us of uh, Luster's excellent tract, and, and uh, glad it's still in print. We uh, commend that tract highly. Uh, just as a yes, okay. Lester Camp, Denver, Colorado. I was thinking that the A to Z concept of fellowship really more accurately describes what. Uh, many people are doing today they want to justify fellowship from a to z with anybody and everybody they want to uh, so as you suggested earlier it's a smoke screen on their part trying to accuse us something of that we don't teach but what in reality is happening is that they're justifying a to z fellowship anybody and everybody that they want to fellowship the circles getting bigger all the time yeah. um, what i was about to say in, in keeping with uh, what David had just said uh, about distinguishing between prayer and praise. Um, near the very closing words of Paul's first letter to Timothy, beginning with verse uh, 14, uh, he speaks of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in its own times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in light unapproachable, which no man hath seen nor can see. And now listen. To whom be honor and power eternal. Amen. Now there's praise. It's not a prayer. It's praise. And uh, those remarks on uh, a little bit of a spillover from yesterday concerning prayer, uh, to whom and through whom, uh, brings us uh, to the next question. Bring us to the next question. Is hand clapping or making your voice sound like an instrument and such all right? What about praise teams? Well, the authorization we have for music in worship is found principally in two passages, as all of us here, I'm quite sure, are aware. And uh, uh, an interesting tie-in with the subject of uh, to whom we are to address our prayers in both of these uh, contexts. Ephesians 5 and verse 19 is one of them, and then we'll look at verse 20 also. Speaking one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, and then verse 20, giving thanks always for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And that spells it out, does it not? But let's turn to the other key passage, which is uh, Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17. And here we have Paul writing. And whatsoever you do, well, that's verse 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto God. And then verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then what's the last part of it? Giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ his Son. So there's the proper direction of our prayers and the intercessor for us as we pray. But let's move back to the question now about hand clapping and making uh, the sounds of uh, instrumental music with the human voice and praise teams. We have uh, maybe three distinct things here, but uh, really only a one, are any of these authorized? Hand clapping is a form of instrumental music. It's percussion. And uh, 
if all that is required of these two passages that tell us to sing is just uh, whatever kind of music uh, we want to uh, use to accompany singing, then uh, whistling would be just as good as uh, making the voice of a, uh, a trumpet with our voices, the sound of a trumpet, or the sound of a flute, or whatever sound somebody might be able to make with their voices. I know we're all aware of uh, where this got started among us. I suppose this was its uh, inceptions with the group called a cappella that was formed uh, oh, almost 30 years ago, I guess now, by a brother by the name of Keith Lancaster, who has for the last several years been uh, the uh, man in charge of uh, I guess he's their worship minister, but he takes care of all of their praise team things at the very liberal Madison Church just out of Nashville, Tennessee. And that brings us to praise teams. Uh, more than likely, those came from uh, denominationalism. I don't know the exact root of them, but uh, that's usually where things of that kind among our brethren come from. Uh, denominations begin them and then some of our brethren are attracted to them and uh, they do not uh, know much of anything of how to determine whether a matter is authorized by scripture or not and so they like it and they begin introducing it and then a few congregations introduce it and then others jump on the bandwagon it was that way with the bus programs of 25, 30, 35 years ago and uh, has been with other things as well. Uh, what is a praise team? It is uh, a group of from usually four to uh, eight individuals that a congregation will give, uh, to which a congregation will give a microphone for each person. They may be seated uh, on the front pew, two on this side, two on that side, four on this side, four on that side. They may be at the back of the auditorium, but they have microphones to amplify their voices. They may be up on the platform, I guess in the churches that use them, it'd be the stage. And uh, there'll be the song leaders. There will often be women among those in the praise teams. And so, um, they will be leaders of the congregation in worship, supposedly. Well, of course, if you have women involved, you have a violation there of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the leadership role of men and women, respectively, which is uh, violated. Uh, even if you don't have women involved, you... Uh, are singling out what are the superior voices which uh, would I imagine make those with less superior voices uh, feel very inferior about their singing. Uh, Rick says he's one of them. To tell you the truth, Rick's a song leader, but uh, now the secret's out. But um, you, you start having a respect of persons, a partiality type thing there, uh, that uh, is not good. But the praise teams in a number of congregations anyway are reserved for the uh, contemporary worship hour. Now, the traditional worship hour in these liberal churches will not have the praise teams, generally speaking. In uh, 1983, Three, I guess, uh, when we did our lectureship on the book of Revelation at Denton. One of the men that we invited to come and uh, present his error was uh, Edward Fudge, uh, next door neighbor down here in Houston. He was an elder <clears throat> from, what's the name of the congregation there? Barry Wright. What, Barry? Barry Wright. Yeah, okay, Barry Wright. And, of course, we invited him there. He had already written his book, The Fire That Consumes, 
which is a tome that will keep your door open if you want to keep it open, uh, denying the doctrine of uh, biblical doctrine of hell. So we invited him there to present his material and had uh, Gary Workman to uh, respond to him, and Gary did an excellent job. But as he and I were sitting on uh, a little pew up at the front before time for him to get up, I just turned to uh, Edward Fudge and said, uh, Brother Fudge, I hear you all have two different services on Sunday morning, one for the liberals and one for the conservatives. <laughs> he said, well, that's not exactly the way I would put it. <laughs> but they were having a, a traditional and a contemporary service. And, of course, even uh, then, 30-plus uh, years ago, they were using women to serve the Lord's Supper and uh, other functions of that kind, ushers and so forth. But the praise teams go with the liberal movement is the point of what I'm saying in all of that. And uh, there uh, simply is no uh, scriptural authority for uh, having that sort of thing. You're, you're just getting one step away from uh, the banjos and the guitars and, and all the rest of it that eventually comes and which has come in some of these uh, liberal churches. Uh, Richland Hills, which it used to be, it's now just the hills because uh, they've got satellite congregations under that same eldership in Fort Worth. Um, they introduced the instrument, I guess, two years ago. It started on Saturday night. Then they started using it on Sunday night. And now it's uh, there as a fixture. Uh, some of you might not know this and about the Richland Hills things. They had to go to court and change the bylaws of that church to introduce the instrument because it was excluded in the original bylaws by which that property was purchased and by which that congregation was established. But brethren of that type do not have any scruples about doing such things. When you cross that hurdle, then uh, you're just free. You do whatever you want to. And that's what they've done. Uh, Gary, would you like to? Sorry. Gary Summers, Winter Park, Florida. The key thing to remember is that singing is to teach, to edify, exhort. Were you edified? <laughs> There you go. And the same thing with making sounds from your voice. Are you edified? Does that accomplish anything that singing is designed to do? No, it doesn't. People do it for the same reason they added the instrument. They like it. They think it sounds good. Uh, but when, uh, if only 50 people out of 200 start clapping, it affects everybody's worship. You either have to allow it and let everybody do it or, or just eliminate it. And uh, the only biblical position is to eliminate it. Uh, as about praise teams, I've heard some people make the argument, well, what's wrong with the, the ladies leading the ladies, soprano and alto, and, and men leading the men? There's just one problem with that. When you don't know a song, men, what do you usually sing? Is <laughs> soprano. So you've got women then leading over the men. But I think uh, you're exactly right on it being a stepping stone to a choir. And uh, I've heard from some people who, for one reason or another, have visited some of these, and they say it really destroys congregational singing. Right. Thank you, Gary. And incidentally, there's a song in your book, and it's in a whole lot of books, uh, His Grace Reaches Me. The bass part has ooh, ah. Not any teaching and exhortation in that either. Now, that song is in our book, but it has the words with it instead of the ooing and ah. But you can't hum and teach and exhort anybody, and you can't ooh and ah and teach and exhort anybody. You can't whistle, you can't clap, you can't do any of that and teach and admonish and exhort one another. And uh, all those points are very well taken. Uh, how about uh, commenting on, in view of this, the uh, drama 
skits. Oh, okay. David asked about commenting on drama and skits and, and so forth. Then and so forth is a great big area there, and a lot of brethren have entered into that, I guess. But uh, I was in a meeting in uh, California a number of years ago. I can't remember the name of the town. It's uh, adjacent to where the Crystal Cathedral is, I know, and I went and saw the Crystal Cathedral. And it's also adjacent to where uh, the uh, Richard Nixon uh, Library and so forth are. But anyway, be that as it might, it might help you locate where it is. Maybe our California brother back there knows where all that is. But anyway, during this meeting, a uh, sister attended. She was a member of the church where I preached in the meeting. And she was lamenting that her son and his wife were attending a congregation in the area. And to raise money for their mission work, they had just uh, finished uh, putting on the uh, Broadway play, and I can't remember all of the name of it, but it's the one about uh, Joseph and his multicolored coat. What's the name of it, Gary? Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Okay, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's a story of Joseph. And, uh, of course, it involves the attempted seduction by Potiphar's wife. And she said, my son just insisted that I come and see this play that they were so proud of. They were putting up, it's in the church building. It's this, they used the platform for the stage. And said, there was one of the deacons up there in little more than a loincloth. And here was one of the sisters in the church trying to seduce him. And that's the extremity of using drama, I guess, uh, by a church. But uh, there's a place, I suppose, for uh, trying to enact some of the things that uh, the Bible does in vacation Bible school and, and places of that kind. But uh, obviously it, it gets way out of hand when when we get to the point where uh, it's a performance and uh, it's uh, entertainment and uh, the value of teaching something is, is just not there. It's, uh, it has other purposes and uses and it makes a mockery of the truth of, of God's Word. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Paul says that the Lord chose by the foolishness of preaching. And I understand that that's not just the action of preaching there, but the thing preached is more than likely what Paul is referring to. But still, we're told to go in all the world and preach the gospel. That means announce it, herald it, sound it forth with the voice particularly. Well, does that mean we can't uh, use... Uh, a movie or a YouTube or these things. No, that's not wrong. We're still preaching the word if we're preaching the word. Uh, Michael, I know you're just busting to say something. Go ahead and finish your. That's all right. Go ahead. I was going to make two comments. Okay. Michael Hatcher from Pensacola, Florida. One, I want you, would like for you to address the idea that some argue that in relationship to praise teams, where is the authority for a song leader? Yeah. Um, so if you would address that. The other thing, I was talking to David over here, uh, Brother Lester Camp's excellent, just a wonderful track on uh, guilt by association. It was written for our lectureship book in 1998 on Christian fellowship. And to go through the list of speakers then, a lot of them are still teaching and doing exactly what they used to. But some of them, uh, there's been quite a change. I'll just read the list of those who wrote for the book because not everyone spoke. Uh, Noah Hackworth, Buster Dobbs, Mark Bass, Stanley Ryan, Kent Bailey, Michael Light, Don Tarbett, Ted Clark, Harold Davidson, Johnny Skaggs, Randy Mabe, 
Bobby Liddell, Tony Smith, Clifford Newell, Eddie Whitten, Paul Vaughn, Tim Nichols, Gus Ofe, Gary Barnes, How Howell Bigham, Gary Grizzell, Mark Mosier, Ira Rice, Tom Waycaster, Ken Willis, me, David Brown, Joel Wheeler, Ronnie Hayes, Curtis Cates, Wayne Coates, Bob Brard, Lester, Dub McClish, Keith Mosier, and then four individuals wrote book reviews, reviews, Gary Summers, David Hester, Daniel Denham, Terry Hightower. Many of them were teaching and doing exactly the same thing when that book was published. There's a lot of them that are no longer doing and teaching the same thing. David Brown, his topic was fellowship and error. What was mine? <laughs> what was mine? Yours, may one congregation withdraw from oh, another. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, let's see, that was also published in... Well, Memphis asked me to speak on it about three years after that, and it's in a Memphis book. And then wasn't it also at Florida School of Preaching? Uh, no, there was the reaffirmation that they asked me to speak on. Oh, well, they wouldn't do that now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a good point to be made about all of that. I look through, uh, I keep a folder in my desk that's handy that has a brochure of every one of our lectureships, just because I need to refer to it once in a while. And uh, when I'm looking for a subject that's handier than getting the book out and looking through the table of contents, I just look at the schedule. And uh, I'm amazed over and over again as I, I look at the literally hundreds of different men who spoke on our lectureships in 21 years there at Pearl Street. Several of them have gone on, of course, they've died. But I think that if I took my shoes off, I could count on my toes and my fingers the number of men out of those living that we could invite to a lectureship today. And it breaks my heart. But that is the reality that we're living in, brethren. Now, David asked about uh, song leaders and scriptural justification. Authorization to sing means that someone has to start a song as an expedient. <laughs> and uh, if someone starts a song, then they would be a song starter at least. I've known some men who were called song leaders who actually were song starters. They would get a song started, but they were not really capable leaders. But uh, they were song starters, and they could start a song. But uh, it's simply a, a matter of uh, expediency that uh, the command itself requires uh, someone to begin a song, and we're to do things decently and in order and someone who can keep the song together and keep it moving and uh, determine what songs are going to be sung. All of these things are expedient matters that uh, would naturally fall into the realm of someone who would be a song leader. It's just like where's the authority for uh, uh, a Bible class and a teacher of a Bible class or determining what material is going to be studied in a Bible class what time the Bible class is going to meet, all of these things are some uh, expedient matters pertaining to a Bible class. We have the same sort of things, not the same things, but the same sort of things involving uh, our singing. The command to sing is behind that. The command uh, is to go preach the gospel, and there are all sorts of expedients involved in working out how we're going to preach the gospel and how we're going to travel to do it, and so forth. And the song leader falls into that same realm. 
Well, we have time, I think, for one more question. <clears throat> and I'm not sure how serious this question is, but I've been asked to deal with it. <laughs> what was the war of words over the Internet between Brother Deb McClish and Terry Hightower? Well, I didn't realize there was a war of words. Now, we had an exchange, but uh, that's not the same thing as a war, is it? <laughs> maybe it was. <laughs> or maybe there will be after he gets through. It was just this simple. Uh, Here's who, 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 who are you? I'm Terry Hightower from Amarillo, Texas. And this letter came to me on December the 15th, and it included a $50 check. And the brethren at North Point, I had preached one sermon, and then Dub preached, I guess, the afternoon sermon. I preached the morning one. And uh, it's where uh, Dub wrote, I'm just pulling a little bit here. I'll make this available to everyone. I'll have it right here. Uh, and on the back side is my response. Uh, it said, <clears throat> he said, uh, accordingly, our check is in, in the amount of $50 is enclosed, which reveals, Dub said to me, what your sermons are worth, meaning that mine are worth his are worth only $25. I preached once, and then he preaches twice. You got it, 25 plus 25. <laughs> see, 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 who was it? Bruce that said that? Okay, yeah. Bruce, you're you're already on my list. But I just wrote, I wrote and thanked them for the check. And there's things in the front you can read. But I said, uh, you know, that he implied. Dub mentioned that this reveals what my sermons are worth, and that this likely means his are worth less. I said, actually, we all know that his feigned self-deprecating remarks don't quite describe the situation. The real truth is that Dub preaches ten-dollar sermons for the inflated price of $25 each. He has even prepared some that are only worth at most a dollar, a dollar fifty, and two dollars, which you no doubt have patiently endured, and, and this to your credit, in exhibiting that you are, quote, Titus 2-2, sound in the faith, in charity, in patience. Uh, since you thought that my latest sermon was worth $50, I immediately began thinking about my other available sermons. I have different prices on various sermons. I have many available for $100 and several which go for $150. I have one $25 lesson I can let you have for $19.99 sometime in the coming year of 2014. Plus, I'm closing out on some which I had mistakenly overpriced at $15, which, upon closer inspection, possess quotes or references to some of Dub's writings, articles, lectureship chapters, etc., which I feel obligated to reprice down to a dollar. A couple of these include several references to Brother Dub's comments that were not written by Levon. So for these... <laughs> So for these, I feel that I will owe you, brethren, $2 each at the close of each lesson, if I can somehow manage the stomach to preach them. Uh, given that you are having, one more paragraph, given that uh, what you are having to settle for on a regular basis from Sunday to Sunday at North Point, it would likely be out of place for you to have me preach from my large stock of $150 uh, or $100 powerful and heartwarming exhortations for at least two reasons. One, you do not have that kind of money to be paying out while you're still numerically small. And two, the shock of these kind of preachments would perhaps be too much for many members, especially when they realize that they don't need their usual no-dose caffeine tablets to try to stay awake when <laughs> the dull one speaks. I understand for Johnny Oxendine and San Mateo, they serve coffee after the lesson so people can wake up the drive home. And I hear members at Bellevue and Pensacola use Michael's taped sermons as equivalent to sleeping tablets. Before Bruce Stulting preaches, now listen to this one, brother, I'm talking about elder authority. Before Bruce Stulting preaches, he reminds the congregation that he is an elder. And then he reads Hebrews 13:17, obey them that have the rule 
over you and submit yourselves. And then he says, I command you to listen attentively to my lesson. John West, of course, similarly threatens his audience with his police weapon. <laughs> In addition to the above changes, I'm also considering greatly reducing the price of any lessons containing material by Johnny Oxendine, Michael Hatcher, David P. Brown, Bruce Dalting, John West, Gary Summers, and Lynn Parker. Uh, whenever I proclaim these lessons from a pulpit, my audience has suggested to me that they thought of uh, other verses as I was speaking. Yeah, they thought of Acts 19.19 19, where they said similar materials were brought together and burned. <laughs> Uh, for these, I said, how about five cents each or maybe just best offer? And then I gave a serious statement. So we'll make these available to you. What Terry didn't tell you. I knew it. <laughs> I wrote him a letter before that thanking him. Now, the reason he was there, he and Vicky just dropped in on a Sunday morning, and I said, do you want to preach this morning or this afternoon? You know, he didn't have a choice not to preach. <laughs> and so he uh, took Sunday morning, and uh, that was uh, what I wanted him to do. But uh, I wrote him a very nice letter of thanks right after he was there. And we had not decided at the time he was there to start paying a drop-in preacher $50 just as a gratuity. And so uh, the letter that he read from me was when we had decided to send that check, and I sent it to him. But I wrote him earlier than that, and I, uh, I thanked him on behalf of the congregation. And I said, uh, uh, it's always good to have someone here so that they can see a contrast between their local preacher and, and what's out there in the world. And... <laughs> I also said uh, you, should, you should feel good about it because thus far we've only had 17 negative responses to your sermon, and that's not too bad since we had only 13 present. <laughs> so then, then I wrote him and sent him a $50 check from the church, and that's the kind of gra gratitude we get. Well, we've managed yesterday and today to end on a very high note. <laughs> I think it's the sound of the cuckoo bird. <laughs> but I do think it's good that brethren enjoy each other. I cannot help but think about, though, reading that list of names and how you can do that in lectureship after lectureship in those days. Some of us haven't moved. We're just simply right where we were. And... Uh, Brother Woods used to describe in talking about the Christian church always wanting to have unity meetings. And he would tell the story of the elderly husband and wife out for a Sunday afternoon drive. And the husband was driving and the wife sitting in the passenger seat. And she complained to her husband why that they didn't sit close together anymore like they did when they were courting. And his response was, I'm sitting in the same place I've always been. And that's the way I think seriously about what we believe in practice relative to the essentials and fundamentals regarding these matters. What the old bowl say of the Christian Church Convention, 1937? Yeah, you'll find us right where you left us. And that's the truth. Truth is the truth is the truth concerning how to become a Christian, live the Christian life, the organization, work, worship of the church. We're right where we've always been. So that isn't a point that seems to have escaped, folks. And when I see those names down there and know what we preached in those uh, lectureship book, and you can see by ordering the tape still, or CD, I guess, nowadays, and getting the book, it's not a bit different from what we preached here ever since, well, all along, since we started, not especially since 2005. Not any changes. Well, who's moved? Who's changed? Who's altered their perspective of what... Just take fellowship. Who's altered it? It's not us. We're still saying the same thing. I think we need that ourselves. It must have been something like that that helped Noah and his wife and three sons and their wives when they were the only ones in the whole world that were what they ought to be. Now, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination saying that just two or three congregations 
uh, in this day and age are the only ones that are going to heaven. I don't mean that. But it, as far as a minority and those who walk the straight and narrow way of truth by the authority of the words of the New Testament, they're fewer and fewer. And seemingly uh, people who used to say what I'm saying now have given that up. They're not about to say it. In fact, um, coming from this past week's bulletin at Forest Hill, they had a great scholarly biblical article that basically said, do you need a hug? And uh, that's what we need to do at times. So Brother Grider said in that is give one another a hug. Well, I thought about writing, an, and I may do it, writing a article that says, Do you need a swift kick in the britches? <laughs> and that's, that's just about what spiritually they do need. And yet they don't know it because they've gone so far from what they used to preach. If he ever really uh, was sold on New Testament preaching and all that it means. We thank you for being here. Be back tonight. We have two sessions tonight. I hope you have a good supper break, and would you bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer?